Good morning to all. So today we are going to talk about CNSTB in children. Uh, CNSTB is almost five to ten percent of all the extra pulmonary TB cases that you see, and uh, children under five years are very prone to get uh, CNSTB because of immature immunity. We have a very high incidence of CNSTB, especially in India, Africa, and Southeast Asia. In fact, in the last uh, month of May. most of the patients that are with tb that i have seen admitted have been cns tb and uh, neuro tb has a very high mortality very high neurological sequelae especially if they come to you in a very late stage then the morbidity and mortality is very high so try and catch the cns tb much earlier so that you don't land up with these sequelae now if you look at the pathophysiology it is due to the hematogenous spread from the lungs usually there's a rich focus in the brain and when that focus ruptures it causes tbm other cns presentations could be tuberculomas especially when you have paradoxical reactions you may see tuberculomas occurring there may be associated spinal tb which you know as spots disease and there is tb encephalopathy and a uh, lot of times you get vasculitis in patients with neuro tb and that is because of uh, affection of the lenticular striate arteries and in such patients aspirin may be required now uh, the modified british medical research council staging for tbm is still what we use and you try and catch the patients in stage 1 tbm because the prognosis is much better if the child comes to you in stage 3 then you are Are going to land up with lot of neuro sequelae. So in stage one, they usually have only fever and headache. They are not going to have any neurological deficits. So whenever a child comes with fever for fifteen days headache, think of TBM, especially in an endemic country. Stage two, you will have signs of meningeal signs. There may be CNS palsy, seizures, and in stage three, they come to you with hemiparesis, focal neurological deficits, decerebrate posturing. There will be coma. so your the disease is really advanced and you don't get much time to get a good prognosis so seizures may be a possibility there will be developmental regression hydrocephalus cranial nerve palsies whenever you suspect cns tb you like to do a csf analysis but before you do a csf analysis always make sure to get an ophthal examination done to make sure there's no papilledema there are no signs of raised eye city if these two things are there you cannot do a csf it's better to do, do an imaging first if there's no papilledema there's no raised eye city do a csf what you would find is basically a lymphocytic predominance high proteins low sugars afp on the smear is very rarely picked up on the csf but you could send us gene expert ultra or a plain expert md uh, mtb refase and it may help you to pick up mtb as well as rifampicin resistance so csf uh, gives you a lot of picture sometimes people talk about csf ada csf ada is not really uh, standardized in children so we don't know how to interpret these results so try and send more of a microbiological di- uh, diagnosis especially in areas like mumbai where you have a very high incidence of drtb among the neuroimaging MRI is always preferred over the CT because of a higher soft tissue resolution. What you will see on an MRI is basal exudates, hydrocephalus, infarcts, and tuberculomas. Sometimes you may just pick up a child with tuberculomas, and you don't know whether this is neurocystis oncosis or any other ring enhancing lesion. And an MR spectroscopy may help you because you look for lipid peaks. In tuberculomas, you get a lipid peaks. Whenever you have CNS TB, always look for involvement of the pulmonary system because in forty to sixty percent of CNS TB, the lungs are involved. So you may pick up sometimes on a pulmonary test. Sometimes you may do a CSF and gene expert may come negative. You could do a gastric lavage or you could do a stool gene expert and look for other areas for microbiological diagnosis of TB. some new tests that have come is csf lam and uh, ngs for tb but these are still in a research form and not really recommended for routine use now the moment you diagnose tb the treatment is if it's drug sensitive tb you are going to give the standard first line regimen of isoniazid rifampicin pyrazinamide ethambutol 
with a continuation phase of 10 months uh, where you just give isoniazid, rifampicin and ethambutol. Remember the dr dose of rifampicin needs to be increased in CNSTB because uh, rifampicin has got a very poor CSF penetration. So you will have to increase the dose of rifampicin to 20 mg per kg per day. Uh, there is a lot of data that has now come out on uh, use of ethionamide in drug sensitive TB, especially with the South Africa data on isoniazid, rifampicin, pyrazinamide and ethionamide. What we do usually is if a patient has papilledema or if the patient has any ophthal involvement, we don't use ethambutol and we replace with ethionamide. And uh, we have had enough data which says that this particular regimen works but doesn't work for six months you need to give it longer and the reason is the complications of tbm that occurs tuberculomas paradoxical reactions hydrocephalus so six months doesn't work really with us among the first line drugs this table gives you a very good uh, overview of which drugs penetrate into the cns isoniazide very good pyrazinamide has also got uh, very good uh, penetration what is bad is rifampicin at the current dosing. So if you are using rifampicin, go up to 20 mg per kg. And ethambutol has got a very poor penetration into the CNS. Streptomycin we hardly use nowadays, but earlier we used to use and it's got a very poor penetration in the CNS. So basically when you're using these first line drugs, be very careful with rifampicin and ethambutol. Among the second line drugs, if you have a drug resistant TB and you're using the second line agents, remember fluoroquinolones, linezolid, cyclosyrin, ethionamide have got a good CNS penetration. But bedaquiline has got a poor penetration and delaminate, we don't really have much data about how it performs into the CNS. So whenever you're devising a regimen for second line drugs, you will have to have it as a tailor-made regimen. Uh, there was some uh, reason about ethionamide not being used in India in drug sensitive TB because India has a lot, very high mono resistance with INH and if you have an INHA gene resistance then ethionamide will not work. So if you get a CNS TB try and get an XDR panel as soon as possible so that you know if the INH is resistance whether it's INHA or CAD G. And if it's a CAD G mutation, then you could still use ethionamide in these patients. So that is one thing that you need to keep in mind. Don't forget that uh, just starting anti-TB treatment is not the end of the story. There's a lot of adjuvant therapy that needs to be given in CNSTB. So adjuvant therapy, you may require drugs that decrease inflammation and cerebral edema. You need drugs that improve the drug penetration and survival. And you want to prevent the neurological sequelae such as hydrocephalus and infox. So corticosteroids are basically to decrease the inflammation. Your Cochrane analysis also says that corticosteroids should be used in pericardial effusion, miliary TB and CNS TB. You have to use it in all stages of TBM and it is known to decrease the vasculitis and the meningeal inflammation. Usually we start with IV dexamethasone 0.15 mg per kg per dose 6 hourly for 5 days and then we shift to oral steroids. We usually use prednisolone but you could shift to oral dexamethasone as well. Give it for a month full dose and then taper over the next 4 to 8 weeks. Sometimes when you have patients who have persistent tuberculomas or they develop uh, paradoxical reactions and you have developed side effects of steroids like cataracts or hypertension you may give other tnf alpha inhibitors to decrease the inflammation such as thalidomide and they are very useful for these two conditions that i told you paradoxical reactions and intracranial tuberculomas just be very careful when using this drug because they are potential teratogenic especially in adolescent females uh, if they get pregnant, they, uh, it may lead to limb hypoplasia in the fetus. So don't use it in adolescence and be very, very careful when you use these drugs. Remember to use aspirin in patients with TBM because it is useful to prevent vasculitis mediated stroke. You don't want a child with TBM with hemiparesis. And the dose is very little. It's 3 to 5 milligram per kg per day. You use it for 3 to 4 months till the risk of stroke comes down. Now, prognosis of TBM 
depends on the stage at which you've diagnosed. Stage one, when you've diagnosed it with fever and headache, you have a good recovery chance. But stage three, you are going to land up with a lot of morbidity and mortality. And morbidity in survivors will be in the form of hydrocephalus, hemiparesis, visual hearing loss, cognitive delays, they'll be bedridden. They may not be ever be able to sit or stand. So those are the problems that occur. And drug-resistant TB worsens the outcome and complicates management. Now complications in pediatric CNS TB, most common is hydrocephalus. Keep in mind hyponatremia. See, CNS TB is an evolving disease. The moment you start drugs also, it's not going to start working immediately. By the time the drugs actually start working, it'll be two or three months down the treatment. By that time, the TB would still be evolving. And you would land up with a patient having hydrocephalus, hyponatremia, stroke may occur. There will be optic nerve atrophy. I've had three patients with complete irreversible blindness. Cranial nerve palsies will occur, seizures, tuberculomas, paradoxical reactions. And the most important is the neurodevelopmental delay. So TB, CNS TB, the moment you start AKT, don't expect a response to therapy. It's going to take some time and that's what you need to explain to your parents as well. Now, if you go to hydrocephalus, it's the most common complication. It's seen in 50 to 80% of children. And mind you, hydrocephalus can start as early as one week of uh, diagnosis to as late as maybe even a year. So it's not necessary that you will get hydrocephalus only in the initial months. You would get hydrocephalus even later down the therapy. So you have to keep a watch for hydrocephalus. How do you keep a watch clinically? They will have signs of raised ICT, but look at lower limb spasticity. Among your pyramidal tracts, your limb fibers, the lower limb fibers are very closest to the ventricles. So once the ventricles start dilating, it affects the pyramidal tracts, especially the lower limbs. And that's what causes the lower limb spasticity. So the moment you get lower limb spasticity started coming up, you know that the hydrocephalus is evolving. The hydrocephalus in CNS TB is basic, basically because of basal exudates and that's why it's known as communicating hydrocephalus. And uh, they will end up with papilledema, raised ICT, visual loss, developmental delay. So you need to identify early. The moment you identify, put them on acetazolamide, give them uh, soda mint so that they don't get any uh, pH disturbances. But also they will require early shunt surgery. Maybe initially you may put the child on a external uh, reservoir omaya chamber and then shift them to a shunt. That depends on the neurosurgery team when they see and assess the child. The other complication that you will commonly see in TBMs is hyponatremia. The sodium goes down and you don't know the cause. Whether it's SIADH, that is a syndrome of inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone or whether it is cerebral salt wasting syndrome. Now, hyponatremia, usually in TBMs, we want to maintain the sodium around 140. We don't want the sodium lesser because then the risk of raised ICT is less. So. The moment you get hyponatremia, the moment the sodium starts going less than 135, you are worried and you want to know the cause. Now, SIADH is basically because of uh, antidiuretic hormone and it's basically water retention that takes place. So it's a dilutional hyponatremia. So in such a patient, what you will get is basically low urine output and the child will be having volume overloaded. Whereas in cases of cerebral salt wasting is ba basically because of renal losses. And the renal losses, the sodium goes down, the child will have increased urine output and there will be hypovolemia. Now this hyponatremia, if untreated, can lead to seizures, it can lead to uh, increased mortality, coma. So you want to maintain the sodium around 114 TBMs. So it's very important to differentiate between SIADH and cerebral salt wasting because the treatment is different. In SIADH, the treatment is basically fluid restriction because you have volume overloaded. And in uh, cerebral salt wasting, you want to give saline, you want to give salt supplements, you want to give fludrocortisone. Whenever you get hyponatremia, before you start uh, correcting that, always collect a urine and do a urine osmolality and you do a urine sodium. If the urine sodium is high, you know it's cerebral salt wasting. If the urine sodium is low or normal, you know it is SIADH. And then look at the urine output. If urine output is very high, you know this is because of cerebral salt wasting. The treatment would be saline, salt, and fludrocortisone. 
and if it is SIADH, you may need to give fluid restriction. So remember when you treat hyponatremia, you don't uh, correct the sodium more than 10 milliequivalents in 24 hours. So you want to correct it at 0.5 milliequivalent per kg per hour. So in 24 hours, you go up to 10 to 12 milliequivalents. If you correct too fast, you'll cause something called a central pontine myelinolysis and that will lead to coma, death and severe neural developmental delay. So be very, very careful when you are uh, treating the hyponatremia and correct it slowly. The other complication that you usually see is cerebral infarcts because of vasculitis and uh, thrombosis of the lenticular striate and the MCA branches. And the infarct areas are usually basal ganglia. That's why you get a lot of patients with tremors and other extrapyramidal involvement. Internal capsule, they will land up with stroke, thalamus. So as a preventive measure, give them aspirin to prevent this particular complication. The other important thing is optic neuritis and optic atrophy. Because of papilledema, they may develop optic atrophy. Because of the TB vasculitis itself, they can develop uh, optic neuritis. So this can be leading to irreversible blindness. So few drugs that you'd be careful when you use in TBM, especially ethambutol and linezolid, both have an ophthalmic involvement and you don't want to cause more trouble because of those drugs. These fundus examinations should be done regularly in TBM patients, at, at least do it every monthly so that you pick up these signs because these patients will not be able to tell you if they have any eye involvement. Cranial nerve palsies that you usually see, basically you will see the sixth nerve because of the raised eye city, left, lateral rectus palsy. You will get the facial nerve involved, especially the upper motor neuron facial palsy, especially in patients who have internal capsule involvement. Third now may be involved because of ptosis and uh, it's usually because of inflammation or hydrocephalus. So keep a watch on all these things. So the key message is early diagnosis and prompt TB treatment with steroids will reduce the mortality and the sequelae. You need CNS drugs that penetrate into the CNS and you will have to tailor made a regimen for CNS TB. Always keep in mind hydrocephalus, infarct, seizures, hyponatremia may evolve over a period of time so keep a watch on that and monitor for neurodevelopmental outcomes for the long run. Thank you very much.